the radical edges of the feminist doctrines are absolutely appalling in my estimation. They, they bear no academic water whatsoever. They're, they're, they're contemptible in their emphasis on um, insistence on collectivized, collectivized identity and, the, and also their insistence that the West is basically best viewed as an oppressive patriarchy, which is simply not true. So I've seen, I've seen a video of you saying that feminists, not radical feminists, but feminists, have an unconscious wish for brutal male domination. It doesn't quite square with what you just told me. Well, one of the things that I'm very curious about is the relative lack of, uh, the relative silence on the part of Western feminists about countries that truly are oppressive, like Saudi Arabia. It's not exactly answering yes, the question, so, though. Oh, it's exactly answering the question, because I'm looking for the psychological reason why there would be much less reaction on the part of the ra radical feminists to countries that generally are oppressive of patriarchies instead of reacting the way they are to Western countries, which genuinely aren't. One of the things that strikes me about the world we live in now is that there are a lot of men who, have, who are struggling to work out where they fit in. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder whether one of the reasons for that is that most boys, as we grow up, we, we're given few mechanisms for dealing with being ignored or belittled or abused or being told we're wrong or, or just being left out. And we hanker for a world that treats us as we used to be treated as little boys. Do you think that is a fair summation of, of a part of the Western world today? Well, I, I think that men, boys, are actively discouraged. And I think that that's a huge error and one that will eventually backfire on women to the degree that they're also attempting to develop masculine abilities. I think they're discouraged because the fundamental um, axiom of the radical leftists is that the West is an oppressive patriarchy and that all of the negative consequences of that are a consequence of, the, of men's actions. And if that's the case, then when you see young men attempting to manifest ambition or competitive ambition, that sort of thing, then it's very easy to punish that or at least not to encourage it and that's not a good thing what for I'm anyone. What I'm asking you is that whether you think that men need help to learn what women have always had to learn, which is that you don't get preferred status just because you exist. No, I don't think men need help to learn that. I don't think that men have ever presumed that and, and I don't think that we have had preferred status just because we exist. For men throughout the bulk of history, life has been extraordinarily brutal. Men have had by far the most dangerous jobs. They've gone to war. They've, they're, they're much less likely to be reproductively successful. There, there's, there, the idea that men have been preferentially treated as a group across history is an absurd idea. A small percentage of men have been more powerful than w men and women, but that is not the same as saying that there's been some gender, some global gender advantage that's characterized human and, interactions. And you don't accept that that, small, that advantage that happened to a small group of men was reflected right through society, right down into family groups, and, and you don't accept that it was... It's been reflected at each level. That men Certainly not at each level. No, I don't think don't there's any think evidence that. whatsoever that that's the case. It's partly the evidence, for example, is that you have twice as many female relatives as you ancestors as male, because the male reproductive success rate is half of that of right. women. Could we talk for a moment about Me Too? You've rejected the idea that we should always believe the victim in a, in a, in a rape. Well, that's rape obvious. That's yes. what happened in uh, the Lynch cases in the 1950s in the United States. The uh, victim uh, was always uh, believed. Yes, and I was going to say that's fair enough. But why not accept the situation as being the victim deserves to be treated as if she's telling the truth in our attempts to get at the truth and in doing that we do our best not to re-victimise her? Because that isn't how the adversarial system works and I don't think But that we why have not a... advocate for that? Because Rather the adversarial sim system is a very effective judicial system and it's certainly the case that among crimes that are falsely reported, rape crimes are at the top of the list. So there is no believing the victim. There's no reason for people to assume that when they enter the criminal justice system that they're going to be treated with kid gloves or treated easily. That but, isn't how it we works. We also know that we have a major social issue in this country, especially domestic violence is a really big issue. Most mm. police call-outs in this country are, are to do with what they call domestic harm. Yes. It's mm. not an issue that we're going to resolve through the traditional adversarial approach of the courts and having victims no, most understand of that would be, they're going to be re-victimized. Most of that would be best addressed by 
um, dealing with alcoholism because most of the cause of domestic violence is alcohol related. It's, it's strongly related. Mm -hmm. it, yes, right. and so we're yes. not looking at the proper causes. But it's not just look, looking at alcoholism. It's 50% it. right right of violent crimes okay. are a consequence mm -hmm. of alcohol intoxication. So it's a huge contributor. Yeah, of course, how the police behave, how the courts behave, is mm -hmm. surely also part of that. I, I wonder whether this is an example of something else that people criticize you for, that in talking about me too, and talking about mm. victims uh, and allegations of rape and so on, mm. you've moved the debate to an extreme. There are false accusations, but that's not a very useful, is that a very useful place really to, to have the argument? I don't think I have moved the debate there. What I've done mostly is to tell men that they should act honorably in relationship to their sexual relationships with women, and I'm quite a traditionalist yeah. in that manner. Yeah. And so I think that the best way to regulate sexual behavior in general is to, is to return to or to value long-term committed monogamous relationships yes. and that's basically the fundamental solution. And you have argued that. No, I, I mm. and, and it has very that. little to do with Me Too and I haven't commented much about Me Too but in general. When you, but when you do and when you have, there's a subtext which is a completely different message that you send to people. It sends signals that women are liars, that men's sexual behavior isn't offensive, is never offensive, that it's a plot. Those messages are carried as well, subtext. I don't, I, what, what evidence do you have well, that that's the sort of thing that I've put forward? I've said almost nothing about Me Too, except yeah. for the danger of believing the victim automatically, well, and then, that's uh, obviously a danger. Well, so then. I have nothing against the Me Too movement, apart from the fact that it has the proclivity to go too far, like most like spontaneous mob movements. Yes, but defining it as the movement that goes too far is a doing that. that goes too far. Yes, but that's, why, why settle on that as, a, as the definition of the Me Too movement rather than something? Well, okay. Sorry, there was a tweet about you that, that suggested, could cas you, it was your tweet, could casual sex necessitate state tyranny? Mm -hmm. The missing responsibility has to be enforced somehow. Mm -hmm. And then that became interpreted as Jordan Peterson believes in enforced monogamy. That was interpreted by a New York journalist That's who knew right. perfectly That's, well yes. that that wasn't what I meant. Exactly. And then that was interpreted mm -hmm. as monogamy should be promoted as the norm. Which well, of course, it is and should which be. Is, which is what happens now, of course. It mm -hmm. is, it is and in most as, cultures yeah, around the world. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Yeah, what so, I meant was So it's not a big statement to make, is it? No, it's, it's, not at all. Yeah, and what yeah. I meant was that if people didn't take individual responsibility for their own sexual propriety, that what would happen would be that there would be totalitarian intervention in the, by the state in order to replace the missing morality. You That's also, all I meant. You also told Joe Rogan, if you're a young, because you wanted to clarify what you meant, mm -hmm. if you're a young man and all the women are rejecting you, then who's got the problem? It's not all the women. Mm -hmm. That's a very bad road to go down. Yes, that's and for sure. I imagine a lot of people would have been very happy to hear you say that. Mm -hmm. now, I've said it repeatedly. Indeed. I mean, I've talked to men continually about right. the fact that so they need to grow up and accept uh, Over a six-month process, mm -hmm. we had that series of statements from you. Speaking clearly is one of your 12 rules. Mm -hmm. And I wonder why it is that in a situation like that and in many other situations, what actually happens is that you sow confusion. Hmm. I don't sow confusion. The journalists that interview me sow confusion. Well, the woman think, who wrote the New York Times Why do you think that Times happens, article. that, oh, that for you her. get misinterpreted in your views so oh, often? With her, it was absolutely clear. I spent two days with her, and we spent 30 seconds talking about enforced monogamy, and she's a very smart woman, and she knew exactly what I meant and chose to make that the centerpiece of the article for, for I would say, to attract attention in a way that was completely inappropriate. But you know it's not just the journalists from the New York Times. You know that this happens over and over and over. That's because the journalists read each other's journalism okay, and they don't so, read the so books the fault, and they the don't watch what I'm saying. Never with you, the fault well, is... Well, no, the yeah. fault is sometimes with me. I okay. mean, it's not right. like I, every, I always say everything perfectly. But there's, there's no... It's, I mean, it's getting dull to read the journalistic accounts because they're just mirror images of everything that's been written over the last year and a half. And the same old things. There's 10 epithets that are generally thrown at me, every one that you can possibly think of. And people have gone over everything I've said to my students for the last 30 years, almost all of which is recorded, and found absolutely no evidence for any of that, even once.